let's get started and um, welcome to everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be opening the session today. Um, my name is Tamara Credo, as I mentioned. I'm based at the Medical Research Council in South Africa um, and involved in a, in a number of guideline and evidence synthesis initiatives. Um, and I'll be co-moderating this session with Christine Lane. Um, this would have been the Guidelines International Network Conference, but given the context, this has been reimagined as a pit stop in the COVID-19 um, marathon. And um, we're really looking forward to the session on discussing rapid guideline development. I think many of you may testify to the fact that health evidence and policy work has been happening at rapid pace. So learning from the colleagues who will be presenting today is going to be fascinating. So we look forward to a lively discussion and um, lots of discussion and debate. Um, so just to introduce the session here, um, we'll, we'll, we'll introduce the speakers in more detail, but just to let you know, we, we are fortunate to have Avri Mustafa, Paul Crisp, Miloslav Kluger, and Walid Alhazani speaking today. Um, we, have, um, we have the declarations of interest up here. And just to add my own, that I have no specific um, interest conflicts to declare with respect to this um, talk, except my involvement with the South African Grade Network and national guidelines on COVID. Um, So we want this to be as interactive as possible. We've given enough time um, for people to have a real discussion and really pick the brains of our fantastic speakers today. The way it will run is we will have, um, we'll introduce each of our speakers. After they've spoken, we will give space for one or two clarifying questions. Um, and after all the speakers have completed their presentations, um, there'll be some discussion amongst them, just some key questions or um, or take home messages that they might want to share. And then we'll open up for um, discussion amongst the group. You're all joined via the chat function. So um, we'll just, between Christine and I, we'll be picking up the questions and, and sharing those with the speakers for them to respond. Um, I'm, I know we have quite a lot of people signed up for today. So if not everyone's question is fielded, we apologize in advance, but we will try to get to, to all the questions that we can. And then of course, afterwards, there'll be a recording of the session available. Um, just a bit about the Guidelines International Network. Uh, many may be familiar with this, but they, they support and lead and strengthen a collaboration in the guideline development, adaptation and implementation world. And um, they do this through many activities, particularly uh, promoting best practice through development um, and learning and building capacity in this guidelines field. So today, the focus is on advantages, disadvantages, and learning from rapid guideline development. Um, and with some examples from colleagues that you'll be familiar with the guidelines that they've been working on within COVID. Um, and so without, Further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, I'm delighted to be introducing Dr. Rima Mustafa, who's a clinician and a methodologist. She's the director of the Outcomes and Implementation Research Unit at the University of Kansas Medical Center. She has extensive experience in guideline development and assessment um, and is actively involved with the grade working group, particularly in her role as a grade in the grade guidance group. And she is um, well known to, to several um, international guideline groups, including the WHO, ASH and others. So Reem, um, you're able to share your own slides. Um, so I will hand over to you and make sure that you are unmuted. So thanks everyone. And yeah, looking forward to the session. Um, so we just need to, un there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara, for the um, kind introduction. And uh, thank you for the, um, for the opportunity to present to you all today. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Okay. This looks great. Thanks. Excellent. So today I'll be talking uh, to with all of you about rapid and living guidelines in the COVID-19 era 
And it's uh, really what we learned that this is a marathon, not a sprint uh, by any mean. Um, my disclosures, which uh, Tamara has showed already, um, I think I just want to highlight that one of the examples I will share with you today, which is the IDSA, the Infectious Disease Society of America, is an effort that has been co-funded by the Evidence Foundation on IDSA. And um, as I, I present about the IDSA example, it is important to highlight that I'm, I'm presenting on behalf of colleagues in the US Grade Network and the Evidence Foundation, um, Ingve Flakyader, uh, Hassan Murad, Rebecca Morgan, Shana Sultan, and myself, we were all involved in this uh, specific experience. I did put here and others because as I'm presenting, I will also mention two other um, guidelines that we've worked on rapidly uh, for, for COVID. Okay. So just to give you all an, an idea of, of uh, the IDSA experience, uh, so the Infectious Disease Society of America were interested in developing rapid guidelines about COVID-19. Um, Ingve already worked with them uh, as a methodologist uh, in the past, so th there was that connection. And, and they came to us asking if we would be able to support them. The, the interesting thing is, um, I do remember the first time um, Ingva reached out to me, it was March 26th in the evening, asking if I'll be uh, interested to help out with the diagnosis uh, part. And I just wanna kind of show you that the first guideline published, it was on uh, April 11th. So this was a truly rapid um, effort um, we quickly came to the realization that we have to think about all what they want to achieve and slice it into um, parts that different people maybe can co-lead to facilitate the process. So we had the treatment and management part, uh, then we have the prevention um, part, and uh, we had the diagnosis part. And as you see, um, you know, April 27 and then May 6, really we were all working in parallel to, to make this actually happen and come out rapidly. As I go through the, the, the short talk today, I'll try to talk about some lessons learned and really is, is how you think about it. You know, some problems are opportunities and, uh, but there are definitely lots of, of important lessons um, as, as we impart on this very exciting opportunity. I think the first thing that became extremely clear that timeliness um, was a key factor. We were running um, and, and really have to get this done very quickly. And in many people's eyes, timeliness was a very, the key to success. So you can do the best guideline, but if you don't publish them in a timely manner, that will be an issue. And um, that really prompted us to think about a few things. The first thing um, relates to what does timeliness even mean? You know, what is the timeline? Um, so this is a work led by um, Eli Akol and, um, and others in the great working group. And, and, and really it's, it's a paper that has now been accepted, but it's an idea that we've talked about even before COVID, which talks about developing trustworthy recommendation as an urgent response. Um, and what, what does the timeline mean? And for us, it became clear with the IDSA that we were kind of targeting this urgent response and maybe a rapid response. Um, so something within a month is what we were hoping to be able to achieve. And then the first question that we had to address is what can be done rapidly while maintaining trustworthiness? And I think this is the main challenge that we've seen many other groups uh, struggle with. Um, it, it was just for some reason, a lot of discussion is just the people defaulted to the old ways. And we had to keep reminding everybody that no. So there were lots of discussion. Okay, well, we will look at RCTs. Those are high level. They lead to high level recommendation. Or if there are observation studies, they lead to lower level recommendation. And like, you know, we've moved past that years ago. And we really are ought to stick to um, the methods we do well, and we know it serves well. So. Um, sticking to grade uh, as a methodology that we're going to use and really focusing on 
highlighting the issues around quality of evidence, the balance of benefits and harms, really making sure that we address the patient's values and preferences, and all these other criteria, resource, equity, acceptability, and feasibility is key. And it is key, especially in the times of a pandemic and in times of urgency and emergency, that we maintain that we are very clear and explicit about this balance. You know, what is the what are the good things and what are the bad things about um, different decisions? So the, this balance of desirable and undesirable effects in the big sense is absolutely key to maintain. And it was quite interesting. Um, around, around that same time, uh, Holga reached out to me uh, to get involved with, uh, with this um, uh, paper, which I very much appreciate. And it's, it was just so interesting because the one word that we kept saying is really no matter what, we have to talk about certainty of evidence, no matter what. And it was um, the perfect thing to have that even in the title of this paper. Now more than ever, and no matter what, we have to talk about certainty and evidence. And I think this is a one, one key, absolute key message that I, I hope we learn and, and never forget uh, after COVID-19 is, is over. Uh, because uh, a lot of the issues with the public health guidance uh, early on, it was because it was not clear what certainty of evidence we were talking about. It was also because there was confusion many times about what are the factors that drove the decision? Was it truly the effectiveness and the balance of benefits and harm, or was it the feasibility or availability and so on? Um, also, uh, it was helpful to have some established guide, uh, guidance. So um, uh, the great working group has is published, and again, under the leadership of Holger, published a checklist for guidelines, which is an effort with Jen and McMaster. Uh, but Rebecca Morgan extended that and already have published about developing development of rapid guidelines and really looked through um, this the existing checklist and what are the things that um, can be done or modified or unique considerations um, for rapid guidelines. So this guidance already existed and was very helpful to kind of go back um, to existing guidance and use it in the time when we absolutely need it. And an important thing is to keep, you know, remember to streamline and expedite the guideline development process for for rapid development and how can we do that. So here are a few things that um, we very early on had to have discussions and be very conscious about related to organizational budget planning and training. Um, it was absolutely key to define our timeline and time frame for the development of the rapid guidelines. So even a discussion about, are we talking about three months? Are we talking about two weeks? Are we talking about a month? It was very helpful to establish early on, and it, 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 it was helpful to know this is our goal and for these reasons. The second thing was about uh, developing standard operating procedures, template, and meeting schedules. Um, this might sound like very simple, um, but again, when we talked about templates, um, there was this uh, notion, oh, you know, we don't have time. We don't have time to be thinking about templates. Now we need to move and we need to work fast. And it is extremely helpful um, to have these templates that exist because actually they do make the work more efficient moving forward. It might be a little bit of an investment in the beginning. Um, uh, same thing with, uh, uh, you know, meeting schedule, let's schedule meetings for the next three months, for the next six months, and we can cancel them. As simple as that does make a big difference. Um, establishing the guideline group process. How are we gonna agree? How are we not gonna agree? And then really importantly, um, what are we gonna do? We're operating, we're, we were meeting every evening uh, for the first iteration of the um, IDSA guideline and uh, people have different commitments. So we had to agree on a time that works for the majority. We had to agree on processes. If some panel members cannot be there, what are we gonna do? But very interestingly, I think um, uh, showing up to th these meetings and, and um, it, it was actually much better, I would say, than some of the other experiences I had where we weren't under rapid guideline, where people, it was much harder to schedule. So people were also very accommodating and and able to schedule. 
it was key, as, as I mentioned, we had the idea, questions about treatment, a diagnosis and prevention. So it was very key to kind of separate those themes and have subcommittees uh, that are uh, working on them uh, in parallel to keep things moving pretty quick. Um, we also had to have very transparent um, uh, agreement, for example, on authorship and, and other things. And not only that, they had to have very early discussion with the journals because um, it would have been uh, kind of funny to be working with that speed and then not have a clear agreement on uh, the review process with the journal that may delay things quite a bit. Um, it, it also publication model. So we were talking about a living guideline and this is what we're doing. So how are we gonna achieve um, those living guidelines? What are we gonna do with, with publication models? So we had to have discussions and I'll show you in a bit uh, on agreement on when is it important to have an actual additional paper, an updated paper and when can we have updates online uh, for smaller changes? Also, um, IDSA had established uh, processes for endorsement with other organizations that were just not feasible to maintain if we really want to move with that timeline. So they had to rethink and negotiate and discuss alternative models if they wanted to maintain um, these endor endorsement uh, models. Um, and again, expedited options for internal and external review. So. Um, that was also a very, very important. And as you see here, for example, the first um, a guideline for treatment was published in early April, and uh, we continue to have online updates for um, smaller uh, updates, if you may, but we also have a plan of when is it time to have an update, um, a published update. And that has worked very, very well. And uh, the users actually appreciate that because that there's not that delay uh, when we may when we have updates, uh, the evidence synthesis is is one of the biggest uh, challenges with the rapid guidelines. So um, it, it really absolutely key to address limited number of questions and uh, to prioritize. Uh, and this is the time when you have to be very clear on what are the questions that need this fast response to right now, and what can wait for the next maybe iteration in a living guideline. Um, it was now more important than ever to remind people about the concept of background and foreground questions, that some questions don't lend themselves into recommendations, and you can write a paragraph about the pathophysiology of hydroxychloroquine or some of the antivirals. This is not a, a question. We need to say our recommendations have to be actionable, do something or don't do something. Um, outcome prioritization process for each PICO should be really brief. While we have those detailed methods of how can we prioritize outcome, uh, we had to uh, make sure to go with very quick decisions and rely on existing decisions that we've agreed on in the past. And that doesn't only uh, apply to IDSA, but another experience I'll mention in a second um, with the American Society of Hematology um, is exact same issue. We have to rely on some decisions that we've made in the past and just modify what needs to be modified for COVID-19. Um, the use of existing review is an interesting issue. Um, in our experience with IDSA, it was not always helpful to use existing reviews because many reviews just did not have the information that will allow us to uh, judge the certainty of evidence. However, reviews that do are actually helpful. And we found that, for example, we did use existing reviews in the prevention um, guideline because they were about other viruses. We didn't even have evidence in COVID-19 and they were pretty well done existing reviews from SARS that we were able to use, but not really uh, existing reviews for treatment or diagnosis as we were going with the guidelines. Uh, it, it, these two points are really key. So to agree on the indirect evidence that will inform the question and to define and record uh, the process used when evidence is uh, determined to be limited. Um, I think it, it is, it's very easy for people to say, okay, well, we don't have, it's very low quality evidence or it's insufficient evidence. We're just gonna go with consensus or expert opinion. 
And, and that is the biggest mistake because these are the times when it's absolutely necessary to maintain a record of what drove your decision, even if it's feasibility or acceptability or you know, resources or whatever it is. And I, I again, I do believe that some um, public health agencies failure to do that affected the, the, the people's uh, uh, trust in, in the process because it wasn't clear that it was a resource issue based on the guidelines. So that's absolutely key. A collaboration, I just wanna say very quickly that it, it, in, in these times of, of needing to do things very rapidly, we are always as good as our teams, but this is really the time when you need to uh, build on established collaboration that you know will bring their A game and you know that they will do the job well and um, it really uh, also a question of how large do you want those collaborations? Because larger collab collaborations don't always mean more efficiency. Sometimes it means more work and organizational work. So we had to balance, you know, a size of the group that will do the work well uh, rapidly, but at the same time, not too big where it becomes very hard to manage. The other thing is really key is the issue of infrastructure. We learned that this is not the time to um, try to establish new infrastructure or try to establish new processes. Um, we've had organizations reach out to us and ask that they now want to hire a new person to do their guidelines rapidly. And, and really, this is probably not the good, best time. You need the most efficient way is to have existing infrastructure and a plan for rapid guideline that you just can enable when you need it. And again, these um, um, the, this guidance from um, the different uh, you know working groups within great was extremely helpful because it existed and we just enabled it and, and mobilized it. Um, one important example here about infrastructure and collaboration is the American Society of Hematology and it's their existing collaboration with the McMaster University and the Magrate Center. And um, uh, they, they already had this existing collaboration for the uh, VTE, venous thromboembolism guideline. So when they wanted to work on an up, uh, an, a rapid guideline for anticoagulation in COVID-19, it was the perfect um, a perfect uh, opportunity to move that forward. And this was, again, one of the uh, guidelines where, as I mentioned, um, uh, really using what we have agreed on with outcomes and other decisions from previous guideline was very, was very helpful with the need for some modifications for COVID. Again, for this guideline, it was very clear and important. We needed to focus on only questions that we can cover and deliver rapidly. And it's very exciting that the first guidelines actually should come out in some form for public review next week. So a preliminary recommendation. So again, this timeliness is absolutely key. Um, I wanna give a different example for implementation tools. So we can do things very rapidly, but if we're doing things rapidly and we can't uh, help the user to implement them, it doesn't help. So. The American Gastroenterology Association, um, uh, Dr. Shana Sultan reached out to me and they wanted to work on diagnosis for specifically for the role of pre-procedure and how to reopen uh, procedure centers. And um, so we had the guidelines, but it became very clear that the decisions may be different depending on the place, hotspots versus you know places with low prevalence. Um, and it was a very um, a useful to already, again, reach out to um, uh, colleagues at Evidence Prime and Great Pro because we had existing tools that are interactive, but they wanted to personalize it to their needs. So it was a very rapid, real collaboration where we were able to have online a tool that a center can actually insert what their prevalence in their own institution they can insert if they're using a specific PCR test and they knew what the test accuracy for that test is, and they can actually find the uh, pre and post test probability through positive and make decisions according to our uh, guideline. And what I understand from um, Shanaz and the AGA group that this has been one of the most popular places where the users and members of AGA actually go to uh, help them make decisions. 
Um, the last thing I want to talk about is dissemination. It makes no sense to do all this rapidly and then have um, the regular process of dissemination. Um, I think uh, planning ahead for webinars, even before the guidelines were done, we had webinars already scheduled. Um, we had the uh, you know uh, PR teams uh, on board to help us disseminate, and it's it's been extremely. Uh, successful with very high attendance rate for these different uh, webinars. And I will stop here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Reem. Wow, thank you for that uh, whirlwind tour through what has been a very exciting um, time and uh, lots of learning. I do want to take an opportunity for a couple of questions. So I'm looking to the chat box um, to see if there's just have to um, any questions coming through? Um, yeah. Oh. So we have a question from Ellie. Thanks for that. So which says, very informative. Thanks, Reem. Which rapid guideline shortcuts um, you feel did not compromise the quality of the process and that you would feel comfortable now using in a standard guideline development? Um, what a great question, Eli. Um, uh, I do think, um, uh, so for example, in some guidelines, we've done a lot of um, work, um, uh, outcome prioritization in this case. I, I don't know if that would apply to all other guidelines, but um, it was very clear and there was consistency among uh, our panels and among patients on what are the critical outcomes for decision making. So we really didn't have to go through uh, very detailed and long processes and surveys to do that. So that was one area, but again, it was the type, the context uh, that everybody agreed. Uh, I think the other, um, the other area where um, uh, we were able to I wouldn't call it shortcuts, but for example, um, uh, we in the past have done um, grade um, assessment, certainty of evidence uh, done by at least two people. Um, some of the processes we used here is it was done by one person and then we circulated to the methods team and just had discussions if we didn't agree. Uh, rather than doing everything. And I think actually that was um, not only, so probably a better process because we had more productive discussions for what matters. Thank you. Um, so those would be kind of two things um, that we've done uh, quickly. Uh, it, it is, again, it's not to skip the certainty, it's just how to efficiently uh, agree on certainty of evidence. Thanks, Reem. I'm just wondering, we, we're we soon going to have Paul come up and, and be introduced and I can show his slide, Christine. But just okay. one more quick question before we shift over is, um, is from uh, Mary about the external review process for a rapid guideline. Can you describe what you did? And in the meantime, I'll just put up the slide about Paul. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so for external review process, um, uh, they, we had identified potential reviewers uh, in collaboration with uh, journals that it was very clear with the timeline that they had noticed that the, um, we will be submitting around this time and that they will have uh, less than a week uh, really to review and they have agreed um, but again, we started like when we started the guideline, we had to reach out to some reviewers and say, you will be getting this three weeks from now, this week, does it work for you? And people had blocked the time, understandably. So this, this early planning did, it was very, very helpful. Um, so th this is what has been done. Again, done differently um, for different organizations for, um, I know for AGA, um, they also had to agree. Sometimes um, they had editors in different journals, and I'm sure Christine can speak to that, you know, where they actually worked as review, served as reviewers to make the process more efficient. Thank you so much, Reem. We'll come back to some of the questions um, after we've heard all the speakers. Over to you, Christine. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's also a pleasure to introduce uh, Paul Chris 
who has been with NICE since 2009 and where he was responsible for setting up the Institute's accreditation program for guideline developers. And more recently, I uh, was the program director of the Medicines and Technologies program. Before joining NICE, Paul spent over 20 years in international medical publishing and communications, focusing on evidence to aid healthcare decision making and the adoption of new medicines. So without uh, further delay, let's uh, move on to hear from Paul. Uh, Paul, I think you can share your slides now. Someone Thank you. Me. I was, uh, yes, I was, I was muted there. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll just share my slides. Okay, can everybody see the slides? We can. Great. Well, thanks, Holger and Milislav and the Gen Scientific Committee for the invitation to speak to you all this afternoon or this morning or this evening, depending on where in the world you are. So um, the title for this was uh, a gin pit stop in the COVID-19 marathon. Um, so as well as being the director for the Centre for Guidelines at NICE, I, I, I do ultramarathons and I prefer to think of this as more of a, a checkpoint in an in an ultra um, and I think we're probably at checkpoint one we are here and what I want to do this afternoon is share some um, some of our experience at NICE some of the highs some of the lows sometimes in the dark but we 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 try to we try to keep smiling and probably share with some of the things that we've we've learned in the process so the core of our, our work in um, to support COVID has been um, a series of rapid guidelines. Um, they've been produced using interim methods and processes and developed in collaboration with NHS England and NHS Improvement. So this is the, uh, the NHS in England uh, using cross speciality clinical groups and supported by specialist societies and, and royal colleges. And like REAM, we also had to pivot very rapidly to produce these guidelines. Um, we produced 21 guidelines in the course of, uh, it was in the course of uh, four months and produced 50, over 50 updates, some greater than others, some minor updates as we've gone along and as the evidence and practice and policy has changed rapidly as we've learned more about this condition and this disease and how to manage it. The guidelines have fallen into four broad areas. Management of COVID-19 or its complications, the care processes and modifications to reduce people's exposure, alterations to care when capacity is limited and alterations to treatment for other pre-existing conditions. And in addition to these guidelines, we've also produced six rapid evidence reviews on some of the medicines used to treat COVID or its symptoms. So we've produced evidence reviews on dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, remdesivir, uh, vitamin D, uh, etc. So the task. Um, we had a call from NHS England um, on Wednesday the 11th of March asking if NICE could produce three rapid guidelines uh, within a week. Um, we had to uh, do this, we had to support the system in responding to the, to the, the pandemic. Uh, and that meant a very rapid decision at a senior level about the priorities within NICE. What we did was we paused all of our work on non-therapeutically critical guidance. That meant that we could dedicate resource to the COVID guidance and to other therapeutically critical guidance that we needed to, to maintain. We were very aware that we did not want to distract the health and care system with guidance or calls for consultation on guidance that was not considered a priority. 
the deadline for the first waves of guidelines was Friday the 20th of March. So we had a week to produce three. Um, and we were, we were advised by our colleagues at NHS England that there would be subsequent waves of guidelines referred with very similar timelines. That was the task in front of us. So what we had to do very quickly was assemble a, a virtual team, bearing in mind that we also had to close our offices um, and we all moved to working virtually. We had to work a new process, uh, work obviously very quickly. And this key point, which I'm sure uh, Reem mentioned and I'm sure others will mention as well, it's that balance between speed and rigor. We had to work quickly and speed was the essence. There was no point um, producing a guideline um, in a year's time because it would not be it would not be useful. The 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 time was now. The context was all. We needed to inform policy as well. Um, so some of the evidence work on specific medicines had to link in with commissioning policy. So policies used by the NHS in England to uh, fund and support the use of of medicines to support. Um, uh, to manage uh, people with COVID. So what did we do? Well, as I mentioned, we, we rapidly pivoted uh, towards um, COVID, support for COVID as our key priority. And we built um, multidisciplinary teams from across uh, NICE, editors, clinical advisors, information specialists, technical analysts, a real multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, this was built around a sort of a, a core stable team um, uh, with, with input from senior pharmacists with clinical experience uh, who could act as topic leads um, for, for this work. We adopted this fast and frugal um, approach to searching the literature. The evidence review was done in parallel to, to check assumptions rather than informing recommendations. So we we looked at what already existed and whether it, we could build on it. We looked where, for evidence where it existed and uh, where it didn't, we used expert consensus. And as you can see, like all of you, I'm sure, we put in uh, long hours to achieve these, these extremely tight deadlines. The core um, steps in producing guidance, we, um, we included, so we had the topic was referred to NICE by NHS England. We did, we, we produced a scope. Obviously, we've developed the guideline. We had a consultation step. Uh, we revised the, the draft guideline in response to the consultation. We had a quality assurance and sign off step um, and um, published. And we have this cycle of rapid updating as the evidence and policy builds. Now, of course, that would normally take between 12 and 24 months. Um, where there is uh, a lot of evidence or, a, or a, a broad clinical question, but we had to respond within a very, very short period of time. So therefore we had to compromise, we had to adopt this, this trade-off. So yes, we had public consultation uh, on the scope. Um, sorry, we had, we, had, we had the scope, we didn't publicly consult on it. We had extensive consultation on the draft uh, uh, guidelines, but it was done within the space of sometimes a day. And like Ream, the key to this was uh, alerting key stakeholders that the guideline, the draft guideline was on its way so that they were ready and teed up to provide us with their comments back uh, within our timeframes. And actually we did get meaningful and robust uh, consultation comments back. Um, our evidence searching was um, we couldn't be as extensive as we would we would normally like. There was a trade-off, um, and we didn't produce extensive information for the public. We had a much smaller writing team, um, and again, it's this issue of collaboration. We had collaboration where where we needed to, but we also needed to be very agile. Um, one key step where we uh, we compromised was we, we'd normally have a patient expert on one of our committees. We couldn't do that in this instance, but what we did ensure was we had good patient group feedback during consultation because the patient voice, of course, is critical. And that's the way we achieved it with these guidelines. And then the final point was we, uh, 
as I say, we've done over 50 um, updates and refreshes to the recommendations. So we had to respond very quickly to feedback, sometimes within a matter of days as policy changed. So what were the key elements of success? Um, we already have a, a, obviously a, 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 a very experienced, capable team in, in producing guidelines. Um, we came at it from the perspective of what's the problem? What's the problem we're trying to fix? What do our users want within what time frame? We were able to marshal significant organizational support for the program and suspend our normal processes, um, but retain our principles. So going back to that model, that flow diagram about the key steps, the principles were all there. It's just that we, we had to compress and iterate. And of course, we had to harness technology uh, as we were all working um, remotely. So the key, the key issues in terms of organization um, were built around how you'd normally manage an incident. So we use sort of the, those principles of incident management. So small, small independent multidisciplinary teams who could take the initiative. Um, we cleared away as much bureaucracy as possible clear lines of responsibility within the teams uh, and a clear line between myself as the director through to our, uh, um, our commissioner, NHS England. We used MS Teams for the teams to collaborate. Uh, virtual meetings were obviously critical to this with people working from home and getting used to working from home and rotating people through the programme as well because it was very intense uh, and we had to make sure that we, we, we could rotate um, staff through the program uh, just to keep people fresh. And then the final point on this slide, um, we iterated our interim methods and processes and baked in those changes. So that, that interim um, process and methods we published uh, on our website on the 17th of July. Uh, so please go and have a look if you would like to. And what we're doing next. So our colleagues at NHS England, um, in parallel to the uh, the national guidelines we were producing, they were also mobilizing their clinical uh, leads. So there were specialty guides produced by NHS England. So what we're now doing is trying to um, migrate and integrate those together and knit them together better, get that coordination so there is um, um, a, a more coherent set of guidelines available to the National Health Service in England. Maintenance is still an issue, obviously, as the evidence policy and practice changes uh, exponentially, we need to keep on top of it and ensure that we have a, a sort of a stratified approach to, um, to surveillance and updating. And I can talk more about that um, uh, maybe in, in Q&A if we have time. We're also looking where we have gaps in existing uh, recommendations and where we need to uh, fill those gaps and that means retaining the capacity to respond to where there's need for rapid guidelines. So, for example, it's likely, highly likely, we will be producing guidance on long COVID. Um, we're continuing to produce advice on potential new treatments and where they would fit in a, in a treatment pathway. One thing that we need to be very mindful of is that we don't just concentrate on COVID guidelines. We also have a, a, a large library of, of guidelines for the National Health Service and for public health and social care in England. And it's critical that we, we restarted that programme. We, we restarted that at the beginning of July. And we're asking during the development and consultation of those guidelines, if there is any COVID context specific um, changes that we need to take into account and that in itself is also quite a task. So lessons learned. Um, we've rapidly adapted to living guidelines. It's an opportunity for us to adapt and try new ways of working. Uh, there's this speed and rigor trade-off that Re mentioned and I'm sure uh, others, other speakers will as well. Um, we, we took a leaf out of uh, New Zealand's approach to, to COVID. Uh, we, we went hard and went early um, in our response. Uh, 20 guidelines in three months, um, but pacing was key. We had to make sure that, that uh, we, we had enough staff uh, working through the programme um, to, keep, to keep pace with, with the, the, the rapid changes. 
and they have been the, the guidelines have been hugely popular um the web page views for the first 20 uh, we had over 2 million hits between march and, and mid june regular checkpoints is key and the virtual way of collaborating is was absolutely essential for the success of this this program so i'm pleased to say that i think we're on the way to a, a decent finish line um and it is an ultra pace is key and you've got to keep those regular checkpoints thank you for listening and i look forward to any questions Christine, you're muted. Oops. Sorry, sorry about that. I was muted and couldn't unmute. Um, so thank you, Paul. That was really um, an impressive, um, impressive amount of work that your group is doing. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in on the chat, I'm, I'm curious, how many people did it take to produce guidelines in three months so bearing in mind we were um, we paused a lot of our work Christine um, I think we had over a hundred staff rotating through the program in in waves there weren't a hundred people over a hundred people working at any one time but the the, the guidelines were the topics were referred to us in waves um, I think we had six waves um, the intensity was greatest up to about mid-April uh, we then could relax the the timelines a little. The first ones were, were produced. We were producing three a week for for um, three weeks. Uh, we then could ease off a little bit, and we gave ourselves two weeks and three weeks to hit deadlines. So it was very intense, and that's why the point about making sure that you have enough people uh, and um, it's not the same people all the time because it, it, it can get very onerous for staff. I, I can only I can only imagine. Um, it looks like um, Miloslav has a question. Tamara, can you unmute him? Yeah, I'm muted. Thank you, Christine. Okay. Uh, thank you, Paul, for excellent presentation. And uh, I would be interested in the, what is the threshold for you between using expert evidence and uh, uh, rapid uh, uh, rapid reviews um, regarding the recommendations. I'm aware, you know, the timing as you presented, it was uh, two weeks or, or, or the hour uh, for the updating. What is, what is your uh, process behind this? Thank you. So we look for evidence where it exists, Milislav. You know, we, we looked at um, we looked at guideline repositories, we looked at the WHO site, uh, we looked across at Public Health England um, because there was a lot of read across with, with um, public health um, advice and guidance. And we also looked at existing, I was going to say pre-COVID nice guidance. So were there any recommendations that we'd already produced that could be um, built upon? Um, where it didn't exist that's where we had to rely on, on expert consensus and bearing in mind that covid is an, uh, is a new disease was a new disease there was more expert consensus i think in some topics at the beginning of the pro process and as the evidence is starting to accumulate and policy and practice changes the the, the challenge now is is the keeping it keeping the program um, and the library up to date we didn't do um, exhaustive literature reviews. We simply didn't have the time. Um, and again, the trade-off here is, are the guidelines sufficiently robust and high enough quality and got face validity, face validity with the clinical community to, um, to be useful and reliable and trustworthy? So I hope that makes sense. We kind of built on what was already there where we could. Okay, I think we have time for one more question before we move to the next presenter. Uh, the, this question comes from uh, Christopher Wolfkill, um, and Christopher is asking, what was the average number of recommendations in each of these rapid guidelines? 
Gosh, that's a good question. The average number of recommendations, I'm thinking it would be about 20 to 25, Christopher, but I'd have to go and count. Um, they're available on our website. Um, please, please go and, and, and look. Um, and some of them, some of the recommendations as well were fairly, um, they're kind of practice points as well as, as, as you know, that some you wouldn't find an exhaustive literature base. They are, they're good practice points and they're about good clinical management. Hence, you do have that, that, that um, expert clinical consensus um, is, is, is where we were, were focusing a lot of the recommendations. So a lot of guidelines in a short time and, and a substantial number of recommendations in, in each one. Um, yes. So I will turn it over to Tamara now to introduce our third speaker. And thank you, Paul. People will have uh, opportunity to ask more questions at the, close, at the closing panel. Thanks, Christine, and yeah, thanks, thanks, Paul. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Miloslav Kluger, who you've all just heard from um, in his question. He is the director and founder of the Czech National Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare and Knowledge Translation, which brings together a number of leading organizations in evidence synthesis and guidelines, as you can see. Um, he is a member of several of these international methods groups and, um, and leading the work in his own country around evidence-based healthcare, evidence synthesis and clinical practice guidelines. So Miloslav, over to you. You can share your slides and welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Tamara, for a nice introduction. Uh, so I am about to upload my slides okay so, so i hope you all can hear me and you see uh, you see my slides yes looks good thanks miloslav okay excellent very good so uh good evening good afternoon good morning everyone depends on where you are currently i'm in the uh, czech republic and we have almost the evening here uh, and uh, let me uh, to share with you our experience with uh, COVID-19 rapid guidelines development and methodology in the, in the Czech Republic. Uh, first of all, for my disclosures, uh, they were already introduced partially by uh, uh, Tamara. The views are my own. However, uh, uh, logically, I'm influenced by an organizations which I'm working with. Uh, so they are all uh, listed uh, here. This works related a lot to our national guideline project, which is supported by European social funds and the principal investigators, uh, Czech Heritage Council, Ministry of Health of Czech Republic and the uh, Institute for Health Information and Statistics as a partners of this, uh, of this project. So a uh, small introduction uh, about our uh, guideline program. Uh, um, it is actually uh, two years back where we started with a trust for a clinical practice guidelines program in the Czech Republic within, within this project. Uh, uh, compared to uh, this, uh, most all organizations like uh, NICE or SIGN, etc., we started much later, it's uh, 18 years later. On the other hand, we saying better late than never. Uh, so we are very happy that we, we have this program. Uh, these slides are showing that uh, we really want it uh, to be robust and rigor in the development and the processes. So we have a guarantee committee, which is represented by most important uh, uh, policymakers, health policymakers in our country. We are having uh, the uh, assessment methodological committee, which uh, is mainly uh, from our colleagues who are members of the, uh, our Cochrane GBI uh, grade centers. Uh, which is placed at Masaryk University. Uh, we have the uh, analyst and epidemiologist from the National Institute for Health Information and Statistics. And we're developing the guidelines together with our national uh, uh, medical societies. 
And uh, for the review, uh, there is a review of both committees I mentioned for every guideline. There is an external review and there is also public review. Then finally, the guideline is approved in last version, published in our national portal and by the Ministry of Health of the Czech Republic. So first of all, the methodology uh, to use. So when we, when we are started, we've got uh, uh, several options. However, none of us are big fans of reinventing of the wheel. So we look for what is the, what is the best uh, we, can, we can use. And we adopted the genetic master checklist and our national methodology is based on uh, GRADE. Well, uh, as you see, we already uh, since 2018 have update 2.2 and another update is actually, uh, we, are pre we are preparing it. So there will be two more chapters uh, quite soon uh, updated and the first chapter will be on the rapid guidelines. And this methodology will be based on the great working uh, rapid guidelines group, which is in submission process as we, as we learned from uh, Reem uh, in the first presentation. And also the second chapter on visual presentation and visual style of clinical practice guidelines, a representation of the strengths of recommendation and levels of evidence. We are currently with my team finalizing this paper and uh, it relates closely with the uh, uh, COVID uh, rapid guidelines, but also with the other guidelines, especially when you do uh, adoption adaptation within any guideline from more than one source, imagine five, uh, six sources, each of them may use a little bit different methodology, each of them may use a little bit different levels of evidence and visual presentation. So it's very important uh, uh, to actually unify this in the guideline uh, presentation. So we are doing some methodological work regarding this as well, it should be uh, published quite soon. So fundamental methodological rapid guidelines aspects in our country is actually what you uh, uh, learned uh, from, from Reem. I will a little bit uh, adapted this. So the levels of urgency, you know, it's not coming just with COVID. However, Tyre and Schoenemann already in 2016 actually uh, defined what is the ultra short emergency response uh, within one to two hours, urgent response one to two weeks, a rapid response up to three months and routine response, which is more than three months. So uh, most of what we learned today was actually about the urgent response within one or two weeks. Uh, and uh, we are somewhere between the urgent and rapid response within, within our guidelines. What is the critically important is the feasibility uh, for number of questions, especially logically, if you have more than 50 questions, uh, it, it can't be done, it can't be done uh, in, a, in a rapid, rapid way. Uh, it relates to the amount of literature you, you have. Uh, you need uh, members with training, this is experience. You need to have coordination capacity. Uh, and of course, political and institutional support. Uh, for the political support, it's, it's um, logically very important. And now in our country, we are quite in quite uh, interesting situation where we actually uh, last week uncalled our Minister of Health and we have appointed a new one. Um, however, uh, I believe that it will be still supportive to the uh, COVID-19 uh, guidelines. Key is the formulation of answerable and feasible question using the standardized acronym, uh, PICO, PECO, PERT, uh, depends on the evidence uh, we synthesizing. Uh, feasible literature searches, we every time, and for COVID-19 especially, starting uh, with the searches of the guidelines signed sites, uh, systematic reviews, and if we don't find any guidelines and systematic reviews, uh, then we actually look for primary studies. Uh, within uh, the COVID-19 guidelines, uh, you still think about, okay, where to do, develop your own rapid review, and where to do, where to actually use expert evidence, and the, the timeliness is the key uh, factor in this. However, we every time want to still be robust with our our guidelines. Um, so it really depends on, on urgency. The next points, we look for the relevance, that's the key, uh, uh, because if you have high quality guideline which is not relevant, you can't use it. Uh, credibility and currency, especially with COVID-19, are important factors. And then decision about uh, adoption or adaptation or development of new recommendation, uh, it really depends if you can uh, fully adopt the guideline from the country without any changes which regarding the COVID seems not, um, 
very applicable so far for us. And updating updating plan, uh, it's very important. Uh, I can give you example from one of our uh, living systematic reviews which we are preparing. Uh, oh, we did the second search after two weeks, and we retrieved 400 new studies actually published within within two within two weeks. So seems that uh, the evidence uh, around the COVID-19 is actually increasing quite similarly right now, like as as the number of uh, uh, COVID-19 positive uh, uh, patients. Well, we also had some challenges and we have some challenges in our country regarding uh, actually the, the COVID-19 guidelines. The first was discussion with several relevant stakeholders in our country if we actually need uh, the COVID-19 guidelines. Um, well, in our country, uh, uh, we're still doing our best to, to uh, change, uh, let's say, the, the situation from expert evidence to uh, evidence-based medicine. We are doing our best since 2013. However, still there are some, uh, we have a lot of a lot of people with a lot of expert opinions, however, not so often based on uh, based on the evidence. So this uh, was uh, our argument for why we actually uh, need guidelines. So the arguments for was that, yeah, there is heterogeneity provided care in our hospitals. Uh, if you are different physicians, they would have a different approaches to patients. We wanted to avoid silly and potentially dangerous interventions, which we actually uh, uh, seen that uh, some physicians were considering. And Did we lose Miloslav? <laughs> I believe so. It looks yes. okay, like we did. Monica, I see it's reconnecting. Okay, oh. Miloslav, we lost you, but you can you can share see, your slides again. And yeah, just yeah. while he's connecting, just to acknowledge and thank the colleagues that are posting questions in the chat and also to those that are responding, thanks to the speakers and others with lots of experience. Miloslav, over to you. Okay, am I, am I fully back with the slides as well? Almost. Yeah, is it? Is, is I'm it not seeing the slides yet. Yeah, I'm already sharing. This is what it's telling me. Can you see the slides now? Christine, can you see them? I can't see them yet. No, I can't see them yet. It, it looks okay, like so it's. They're uh, there now. There oh. <laughs> Whoops, they were there. Okay, I was impatient, so uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm putting them again, so hopefully you can see them. I'm sorry, there were some technical difficulties with my connection. Is it better now? Can you see the slides and can you hear me? Hear yeah, you well, and we'll just wait. I think the slides will come any moment. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, there we go. So, okay, excellent. Uh, so, sorry, sorry about this. Uh, well, so I hope you you heard last. So I was speaking about that uh, uh, the the guidelines are important, especially that uh, there is a lot of uh, preprints published, etc. We actually heard very uh, good session um, this morning about about this topic. And yeah, the, the guidelines, that's the reason why we need them, because uh, we can distinguish uh, between uh, the uh, robust research and uh, uh, between the, the research which, which might be flawed. So that's very, very key. The second uh, challenge we actually have and we're facing right now, we, it's the epidemics uh, of COVID-19 in, in our country. We actually had a very good results and numbers in our first wave. Uh, in terms of infected population, capacity of beds, capacity of ICU, all of this was actually uh, uh, very good. And over the summer, the results were very good. However, uh, we are now actually uh, having not good results in the second wave. Uh, uh, we have a lot of infected population. Uh, we don't have enough capacity of testing and capacity of tracking right now. And this is one of the reasons why actually we're experiencing some delays um, within this uh, within this guideline development as uh, all our physicians are now very, very busy uh, in, in their in their wards. So, uh, 
here is the example of our COVID-19 um, rapid guideline. Uh, we are in a final stage. Uh, and as I said, due to these complications, it was not, uh, not uh, published, uh, published yet. However, uh, we still wanted to uh, develop a trustworthy, credible guideline uh, based on the best available evidence, which uh, uh, we were able to, to find. The guidelines for clinicians who work in hospital and on ICU, the population, uh, uh, people suspected or with COVID-19, and we decided to have a two phases of the rapid guideline, and the guideline will be in the living, living mode. So for the first phase, of the uh, clinical guideline. We actually choose this areas, which I'm showing this first uh, four. The first one, indication of hospitalization uh, for COVID-19 uh, positive or suspected patients. Uh, the second, uh, well, the second, third, and four, they are all about effectiveness uh, and safety of uh, different drugs on COVID-19. Uh, and this is in the first phase. And the second phase, when the first phase is published, will be you know, next following uh, uh, questions about the other treatment and then the other questions will follow as well. So our guideline panel, the guarantor is uh, uh, Professor Cherny who actually is a chairman of the American Society for Anesthesiology Station in our country and also on ICUs. Uh, uh, the methodologist Dr. Kluami and we have information specialist uh, Simona slezak -Wawi. With the team you can see uh, those are actually all the chief physicians on our teaching uh, and large hospitals. Uh, and uh, they are now uh, actually very busy with uh, the new strategy of the new Minister of Health and also with their patients. So hopefully we can finish the guidelines soon. We are almost, uh, almost there. So the searching for evidence, uh, based on our key questions, I just showed you the areas. I was not going to the details uh, with the, with the uh, key questions, which are defined by the PICO acronyms. For this particular guidelines and questions, we searched 60 databases and platforms with the content of clinical practice guidelines and systematic reviews. Normally we search about 72. However, for the COVID, uh, we found that the relevant content could be in a 60 of them. Last search update was 22nd of uh, September. We identified uh, for the first area, 40 potentially relevant guidelines and systematic reviews. And for the questions uh, or areas two and four, we identified 54 potentially relevant uh, and only uh, uh, clinical practice guidelines or rapid, uh, rapid guidelines. So uh, what is our approach to relevance, credibility, and currency? Well, for relevant, there are actually six guidelines altogether. And for the cred credibility, uh, we use agree two tool for the guidelines and our threshold for the COVID-19 is 60% or best available if we uh, don't find any which is over 60%, we uh, are actually seeking for best uh, available. Uh, normally our thresholds, normal uh, guidelines is uh, 70, 70%. Uh, well, currency, uh, in this case, all of the guidelines were, uh, were current. And the first uh, actually guideline for the first question, we found uh, that uh, Best available based on our search and assessment was uh, uh, this particular NICE guideline. So thank you, Paul, uh, on these. And we are thinking about to adapt this one. They are still, uh, this is still a work in progress. Uh, however, these uh, are areas uh, we identified uh, with a score over 70% the Australian guidelines for clinical care, which is the guideline of our choice uh, from the Australian National COVID-19 uh, clinical evidence task force and we have a permission for adoption uh, of this guideline and this is nearly finished uh, already. Our next steps, the publication of first phase within the two weeks time, uh, developing second phase within the four weeks time and then other phases will uh, probably follows. Living mode, uh, it will be done weekly. Uh, we have a great advantage because the mentioned Australian guideline actually is, uh, is uh, updated uh, every week. Um, so uh, this is a very good source and uh, we will do searches until the guideline, which is uh, until the project, which is sponsored by Canadian Institute of Health Research with title, a systematic and living evidence and guideline recommendation of COVID-19 will bring its first results. Then 
won't be necessary for us to make the searches ourselves and we will rely on this COVID map uh, evidence. And Dr. Tamara Quido is a member of the executive team. Uh, and uh, let me invite uh, you for tomorrow's session uh, where she will give details about this. And uh, one more invitation from my side. Uh, well, uh, in 2021, uh, we are host for Global Evidence Summit. Uh, we are fully aware of the situation with the COVID-19 in the world. However, we are uh, preparing for wars and hope, hoping for best. So this is our attitude. So I hope I will uh, see you all in Prague in 2021, or at least online. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Miloslav, for that wonderful presentation and also to, to present this alternative approach, which I can really appreciate coming from the region that I do in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we don't have access to teams that can, um, you know, do de novo development. So this approach is really interesting to hear about and thanks for you for presenting it with, with both humor and insight. So I'm just looking for any questions, clarifying questions, coming through on the chat. Um, so if anyone wants to post a question there, or if any of the speakers want to um, pose a question to Miloslav. Tamara, I'll, I'll pose a question if there are not, no other ones coming in. It doesn't look like there are any right now. Um, so people think about your questions. Um, I guess this is less of a, a sort of a question and a comment. I think that this approach is really interesting. And one of the things that um, I've been thinking about since Reem's presentation and thinking about a lot as we look at the systematic reviews and the guidelines that are um, being submitted to the journal is we have different groups working on the same topics in different regions of the world, different uh, professional organizations within the same region. You know, we've had, you know, for example, there are some topics within COVID that we've had more than 10 systematic reviews on that topic submitted to the journal for review. And given how hard everybody is working and the pressure for speed, it just seems that, you know, there, there, there's an opportunity um, for a lot more collaboration and organization that would allow, um, you know, the, the production of high quality guidelines, they, they would need adaptation as Miloslav, um, you know, group is doing, but it seems like there's a lot of duplicative work um, and, and that's bad for efficiency. It also can result in slightly different recommendations um, on the same topic, which creates confusion for clinicians and their patients. So I was wondering whether um, Miloslav had any, um, you know, and I think this is really interesting work because it begins to, um, to, to do that inner group um, collaboration. Yeah, uh, thank you for the comment, Christine. I think that's, this is exactly what we can observe because within our uh, guideline project, we actually searching, as I said, about 72 guideline sites and we usually are able to most of the topics we are involved we can we can use several guidelines which are published in the same year for example uh, and uh, regarding these ideas you know i'm involved in a, a european cost action called fbres evidence-based research and we are talking there about important issue which is the research waste and actually uh, and it's mainly focused on the primary research waste and the systematic reuse research waste however I see a lot of research waste within the guideline development as well. Uh, so what, what uh, I hope will, will help is the, is the uh, prospective register of the guidelines, which will be also introduced tomorrow. Uh, so I think this is, this is quite a uh, logic, uh, logic step what we need to accommodate as we have this quite long time in systematic reviews. We need this one in a guideline as well. Thank you. Very, very impressive work. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah, absolutely. And so perhaps maybe just to um, move forward with our introducing the next speaker, and I'll just hand over to Christine to go ahead. Thanks very much. And thank you, Miloslav. 
Hello again, every, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Walid Alhazani, who's an intensivist, gastroenterologist, and methodologist um, at McMaster University in Canada. Uh, Dr. Alhazani is the lead methodologist on several international uh, prominent practice guidelines, including the Surviving Sepsis Campaign and the um, COVID-19 guidelines. Dr. Alzani has led many clinical practice guidelines with professional societies such as SCCM, ESICM, ACCP, and ATS. He is the chair of the Guidelines in Intensive Care Development and Evaluation Group and academic group that provides methodologic support for guideline development in the field of critical care medicine, obviously a specialty that is quite busy during the current pandemic. Uh, Dr. Alazani is the chair of the Practice Guidelines chapter under the Saudi Critical Care Society and has published more than 130 research articles. He is a CIHR-funded clinical trialist and expert in systematic reviews and practice guideline development. So uh, everyone, welcome Dr. Alazani, and I will turn the screen over to you. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I hope people can uh, hear and see me. I will try to share my screen so folks can see my slides. So please stop me if there are any issues with um, seeing my slides. First of all, I would like the, uh, to thank the organizing committee for having me to share our experience today about the uh, uh, rapid developments of uh, surviving sepsis campaign COVID-19 guidelines. These are my disclosures. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm a chair of the guide group, which uh, supports many of those guidelines. I'm also the co-chair of the guidelines I'm gonna speak about. Uh, in addition, I'm a section editor in Intensive Care Medicine Journal in which this guideline was published in. So you could perceive those as intellectual conflicts. Uh, before I start to dive into the topic, I would like to thank my um, fantastic colleagues, uh, both co-chairs of the guidelines, uh, Laura Evans and Andy uh, uh, Rhodes, also the two professional societies that supported this guideline and the other fantastic uh, members of the guide group and the expert panel and um, our phenomenal project uh, manager, Sarah Kelvin. When the pandemic started, there were a lot of official and unofficial um, recommendations that came out asking people to use different um, different things which uh, anywhere from uh, using a detergent um, to using a ventilator for two patients. I think we all um, uh, who are uh, functioning in a leadership capacity and guideline development of the critical care field have felt um, pressured to help issue some evidence-based uh, recommendations. Um, so the Surviving Sepsis Campaign um, uh, COVID-19 Guidelines was published in, simultaneously in two journals. Uh, the initial start date was around February 25th, so we started early on in the course of the pandemic. Uh, the uh, uh, publication online was around March uh, 23rd. We ended up issuing 54 statements. Uh, four of those were best practice or good practice statements depending how, which terminology you like to use. Nine were strong recommendations, uh, 35 were weak recommendations. On six occasions, we were not able to issue any recommendations. Um, and, and I think the guideline have been perceived uh, or received very well, uh, at least on Google Scholar citations at over a thousand in a very short period of time. And at least one single website, the downloads of the, of the article is, is in the hundreds of thousands. Now, we started by um, assembling the team. The team uh, involved, as you can see, clinical experts um, um, and content experts, uh, given the pandemic. And uh, it's hard to say there are content experts uh, within two or three months of the pandemic, but at least those experts who suffered a lot from, um, from the disease in their countries. Also, we had a, we're lucky to have a strong methodology team and also a systematic review team. Um, our panel, um, was assembled from all over the world. Um, areas that are labeled in red are uh, at that time had a very high number of cases. 
uh, those in yellow or orange were moderate number of cases and in, we were lucky in, in Canada and, and other parts of the world we didn't have uh, a, a bad uh, you know disease burden at the beginning of the pandemic so you can see there is some variability in terms of geographic location and the involvement of disease in those locations we probably should have done better in terms of gender uh, balance but we hope to do so on future uh, updates the first thing we, we faced was conflict of interest and management. Uh, we did use a fantastic software, GD, GDT, and use the, the standard WHA forms. Uh, but, you know, in the course of a pandemic, uh, where you really want those who are uh, experts in the, in the disease itself and those who are leading probably trials um, um, are on this condition to be participating, some may perceive those as intellectual conflict of interest. We were a little bit lenient when it came to intellectual conflict given the, the unusual circumstances of the pandemic. This is what we planned. So we did actually draft a protocol within a few days uh, to, uh, as a roadmap to start the, um, the guideline development process. And this slide just summarizes what we envisioned at that time that we were gonna do. Um, uh, however, throughout the process of, the, of, of uh, you know, developing the guideline, we realized there wasn't a lot of recommendations or direct recommendations that we could um, adapt um, and not too many guidelines that use the grade approach, which we are using. Um, also, we found that evidence decision framework, which I think it's a phenomenal way to move from evidence to a recommendation um, would probably require some learning um, a curve for panel members. So we decided to skip um, these two parts to make the guideline more efficient. And it looked something like this, in which, um, you know, assembling the evidence was more focused on direct versus indirect evidence and looking for reviews, and also having the safety net of asking experts to help supplement the evidence in case we missed anything. Um, and relying on expert methodologists leading us during the discussion and coming up with recommendations. And I think one of the key things um, um, in a rapid guideline development is the balance between must have items on your guideline checklist and those items that are good to have that are uh, additive, but they are not a must and they don't jeopardize the, the um, uh, quality of the guideline very much. Um, for instance, um, selection of topics and, and the PICO questions for any given guideline, people may think that's a simple task. Actually, we spend quite a bit of time when we look at traditional guidelines that we have been involved with, you know, doing electronic voting uh, among the experts, also surveying uh, clinicians to see where areas that, you know, there is variability in clinical practice and um, uh, you know, achieve discussion and consensus on certain topics. In our guideline, the rapid uh, COVID-19 guidelines, we skipped most of those. We prioritize the topics within the leadership and uh, the stakeholders that have been involved were the chairs and, and the world experts in the field, as opposed to having multi-level involvement in traditional guidelines where you would like to have patient representatives weighing in which topics matter to them and which areas to, to be addressed, experts, uh, etc. Um, also, the focus of the questions were really focused on high priority areas where we think we were thought that clinicians need guidance um, quickly, as opposed to traditional guidelines where this is really variable, you know, while people think they should focus on high priority areas, but sometimes it's not the case. And more importantly, it's the timing for prioritization. It took us a few days to decide on which areas and questions to tackle, as opposed to weeks or months uh, back and forth with the panel to nail down the exact topic. So that's an example of um, a difference or, or areas that we tried to uh, cut. Um, again, um, obviously with any grade-based guideline, you wanna prioritize outcomes. To make our guidelines more efficient, we focused on the trade-off between mortality. It seems that this uh, virus is involving many or uh, millions of, of people and uh, even if a small proportion die and, or get admitted to the intensive care unit, um, it will create a huge burden. So we focused on outcomes like mortality. Uh, for mechanical ventilation questions, we focused on you know, need for intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation, et cetera. Also the trade-off with adverse events or any downsides of intervention, just to make things more pragmatic. So we did not follow the usual traditional approach, list the outcomes, prioritize them, et cetera. 
And we use the GDT software, which I think is a fantastic software. I would use it every single time I develop guidelines. And just to declare, I am not related to uh, GDT by any means. Um, and we listed, uh, I believe, 55 or 54 questions. Um, finding and summarizing the evidence, as my colleagues have mentioned, is probably the most cumbersome task with any guideline development process. Uh, you want to develop systematic searches, um, but I think the key here is developing teams and organization and, and uh, project management is absolutely important. And also where do you draw the threshold between being a pragmatic or dogmatic when it comes to searches? And um, I also found that having strict or not strict, like very explicit criteria or guidance on when and what to do with the indirect evidence was really useful as I'm gonna show you in the next few slides. So we did have um, three different sources or three different angles for searching the evidence. Obviously at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, looking for COVID-19 related literature probably uh, was um, not very, very helpful. Uh, but we did have a huge team of uh, systematic reviewers uh, screening the guidelines almost daily basis. Uh, we also had experienced methodologists looking for indirect evidence, especially in areas related to critical uh, illness and management of the ventilator and sepsis, uh, et cetera. And we have experts as well as a safety net to help guide us if there are important studies that they're aware of or involved in that have been missed. And again, imagine this hypothetical diagram just to, to um, um, you know, on the y-axis, you have the impact on the recommendations. So better recommendations at the top or, uh, uh, you know, poor recommendations are at the bottom end. And on the x-axis is the quality of the review. Obviously, uh, on the very left uh, side is poorly done reviews and, and a Cochrane style of top quality reviews. You see a, a, probably a linear relationship. The better the review, the more comprehensive you get the, uh, uh, your hands on evidence, probably you inform your recommendations. But I, I think the increment uh, and benefit towards the end of that curve is, is not huge, but the investment of time would be huge, as opposed to things like, you know, searching several databases, for, you know, including in English language studies, um, you know, looking for gray literature, abstract, etc. cetera. Uh, it's a good to have, in my opinion. Uh, again, it depends on the topic, whether there's a lot of evidence on it or not, but uh, others may consider, well, you know, the impact on recommendations may not be that uh, high. So there has to be some sort of a threshold you draw with your team and where you want to set the bar when it comes to how comprehensive um, the search is gonna be versus the time investment. I'm going to share with you a couple of algorithms that we developed just for the purposes of this uh, guideline uh, uh, streamlining the process. And, and again, um, you know, because we assumed um, and rightly assumed, I would say that most of the evidence in terms of management of, of mechanical ventilation, et cetera, would come from an indirect evidence in patients with ARDS, for instance. And we um, uh, did ask uh, the uh, systematic reviewers on the panel to be aware uh, of this and also to follow uh, those algorithms as much as possible. And we think the major indirectness here would relate to population. Um, and the two focuses were, is it biologically plausible to extrapolate from, from uh, different population? Also, is there an effect modifier that we think a specific intervention would work in a, in a different way in that population? Depending on what the judgment of the panel and the experts, the decision whether to include or not include uh, uh, direct evidence is, uh, is made. We also made some, um, uh, you know, uh, simplified approach on uh, what to do and when to use indirectness to inform a recommendation, which I'm not going to go through uh, in detail just for the sake of the time at the moment, but I'm happy to do so if needed after, after the talk. Uh, a good example of, uh, of uh, you know, an appropriate use of indirect evidence, for instance, is our, um, when we looked at uh, steroids, corticosteroids used in patients with ARDS. We um, actually did this uh, meta-analysis quickly. Um, uh, it's a rapid review and uh, this outcome is mortality and we found a relative risk reduction of 25% in, in, in general uh, ARDS population. Subsequently, at that time, we had no recovery trial. There were no trials published on steroids. And subsequently, you know, a nice meta-analysis was published uh, last month or earlier this month, actually, in JAMA that, uh, again, it looked only at COVID uh, patients, um, um, 
more than 1,500 uh, patients in, uh, involved in this meta-analysis and the relative risk reduction was about 30%. So again, uh, I think there was a, a good example of, of uh, you know, how indirect evidence could help in the right context inform recommendations. Obviously, the strength of recommendation would change now, now that, now that we are more certain that this effect translates into the COVID-19 population. Moving to recommendations um, uh, formulation, we use the GRADE approach. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, we did not use the evidence to decision framework uh, per se, but we did use the, the exact uh, components of the framework pragmatically. Uh, but I also would like to stress on uh, a point uh, that I think is important is having an experienced methodology team or experienced methodologist leading the guideline. A rapid guideline development can be extremely stressful, time consuming um, uh, on everybody, um, panel members and, and uh, methodologists. So whoever is leading the guideline absolutely have, the, have to have uh, the skill, methodological skills and also the management skills to help steer um, um, the project forward. Um, writing was a big chunk also of the guideline. Obviously, when developing a guideline, um, um, writing is a big component. So project management uh, goes without saying, but also we had a small writing committee and writing of the recommendations and the sections went uh, simultaneously. So uh, with each section that we we finish and we achieve consensus with, we, we ensure that the section gets written within a few days and we get feedback. So by the end of um, uh, you know, the guideline development, we have a semi-ready document for panel to, to uh, review. We also engage societies early and uh, journals uh, um, uh, early. We, in this situation, we had two journals co-publishing the, um, um, the, the article, which adds, adds a more of a different angle to, to things. And also we were lucky to have a fast peer review process. I have to say it was extensive peer review. I was impressed by the amount of comments and details and the efficiency. So we were lucky in that aspect as well. Uh, this slide summarizes how I think we would do things in the future. Uh, I would love to um, uh, you know, have the same approach with more emphasis on using evidence to decision framework. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of things in the, in the final um, few slides. So for future con considerations, I think rapid comprehensive reviews are extremely important. Uh, I think funding and resources are absolutely crucial. Um, not too many funding agencies help support guideline development. Um, and another important uh, point that uh, uh, Christine had mentioned is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. I think there is a huge room to collaborate, even with sharing the evidence, sharing the reviews, uh, sharing resources, uh, would be a, a, a huge area that I think we could all work on in the future. Also, you know, exciting stuff that might come down the road. I'm, I'm by no means no expert in artificial intelligence, but uh, AI could help in, in streamlining reviews in the future, possibly. Um, uh, patients and public member involvement, would love to involve them. The issue is um, I haven't, or we haven't figured out how to best involve uh, a patient representative in this very crunch, stressful, you know, development process. They may need some sort of uh, training and, and, and be committed in time to review this huge number of, you know, information, very short period of time and ensure they are giving us informed decisions. So this is an area that I think we can, we can all work on to, to improve. Uh, and I think training of methodologists and, and guideline chairs and expert panel, one thing that helps us in this guideline that the team that led the guideline, we have worked together for several years on developing surviving sepsis uh, guidelines. So they are already familiar with the grade development process. So unlike what Bree mentioned, for instance, in her presentation that, uh, you know, that there were many questions about, you know, why an RCT does not result in a strong recommendation as opposed to an observational study. So I think, you know, we did not face this luckily, but we did, we were lucky to have an experienced team. Um, and, and lastly, I think a careful tracking and feedback process is absolutely important because there isn't an ideal way to develop a rapid guideline and, and learning from mistakes and also like what we learned from, from colleagues today is, is the way to go. Thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. Oops. Thank you very much, Waleed. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, one of the questions uh, related to patient involvement, but I think you actually just answered that one uh, before um, before it was uh, before it was asked. So I will move to 
uh, Kristen DeAncy's question. Uh, Kristen asks, what were the pitfalls, if any, of using indirect evidence uh, for the current situation? Yes, uh, the excellent question. So I showed you the bright side of, uh, or a, a brighter example of using an indirect evidence. Um, one of the things that we looked at was indirect evidence of, from observational data. So there is already a lower quality, um, um, you know, studies to start with in non-COVID-19 uh, viruses. And, and in that observational, you know, body of evidence that the, the signal was showing more of a harm in patients who have have you know, viral pneumonia in general, not the critically ill population with RDS. And by looking at this, the panel was very concerned that uh, you know, we can't, we should caution uh, clinicians about the routine use of, of uh, steroids. So we ended up issuing a weak recommendation, for instance, uh, conditional recommendation, say, suggesting to clinicians to avoid using steroids routinely in, in those patients until more evidence is available. And then subsequent evidence, as you all know, came suggesting that even in patients with, with hypoxia and pneumonia, it seems that steroids may actually improve the outcomes of those patients. So the direction of the recommendation would change. So, um, you know, in hindsight, I don't think there is a, um, uh, a better approach, but indirect evidence is, is you always have to be cautious. And, and when you deal with indirect evidence, this is why having some sort of a framework to help, you know, uh, panel members and methodologists, systematic reviewers also, you know, go through the thought process and decide at least in a systematic fashion which indirect evidence is more plausible to, to uh, base some recommendations on and which is not. Um, um, another example is the hydroxychloroquine, for instance, and other interventions have been used in other vital diseases. We ended up saying, well, that's probably a new disease. We really can't extrapolate. We have no idea if, if, if these medications would work similarly or dissimilarly in this population. So we'd rather wait and, and not issue a recommendation and again, by following this uh, framework that I showed you, at least we had a, a systematic reproducible approach. Thank you. Um, the, the next question comes from Henning Thole, who asked, what is the main difference from the newly developed rapid processes from older or other rapid processes like rapid HTA? And do the new processes offer evidence to streamline our up to now procedures? I am not sure I understand the question um, uh, fully, I'll be honest. If someone can re-articulate the question or... Um, I mean, I was, um, I assume that there are other, you know, pre-pandemic there were, um, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not fam familiar with rapid HTA, but I think that there were other um, groups who were developing rapid rapid review and rapid guideline methods. And so I think the question pertains to how does what um, your group is doing differ um, yes. from those processes and uh, have you, what have you learned that might help to modify those other processes? Got it. Uh, in order for me to uh, correctly answer this question, I have to be familiar with the methodology of these previous guidelines, and, and um, which I'm not. Uh, but I could say the the, uh, um, uh, the 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 slide that I've showed I think summarizes um, the slide about future consideration, the challenges, and the things that we we've we've, um, we have learned through this guideline development process. But I also learned that. Um, you know, um, we are able to produce, um, you know, good quality uh, um, science when needed, when pushed uh, in a very short period of time, as long as we, um, you know, prepare for it and have the appropriate infrastructure to do so. So I think a big learning point is to ensure as every single uh, one of my colleagues have mentioned is to have the proper resources and infrastructure to, to deal with this in the future and also to learn from each other. The next question um, is uh, asking if you can explain in more detail how you reached consensus on the balance between benefits and harms since you didn't apply the grade ETD. Okay, so, so when I said that we didn't use the um, evidence of decision framework, I meant we didn't use the, uh, um, the actual platform, uh, which I love very much. Uh, but, but we we did follow or adhere to the grade 
um, um, process. So every time we make a recommendation, there has to be a trade-off between benefit and harm, you know, looking at cost, resources, you know, the acceptability, feasibility of an intervention. So all those have been discussed uh, on teleconferences or electronically, but um, 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 in fact, summarized by the methodologist and the expert assigned to that question that presented to the to the team, and then the met experienced methodologist help and with the chairs, uh, you know, um, um, supervise or steer the discussion towards the recommendation. So we did use the principles, but I was referring more towards the actual uh, platform, which I think is very, very, uh, very useful. Um, the other thing I would like to mention, and other guidelines we, you know, especially with, with those societies we, uh, that I work with very closely, is we require some sort of electronic voting. Um, we didn't do that for this uh, guideline because electronic voting requires preparing the votes, uh, sending them, and I also believe that discussion and consensus um, carries more weight in understanding the meaning of recommendation between the panel as opposed to asking folks to vote on their own um, with, without having input from colleagues, which you know may or may not be the right thing to do. And I think we'll take one more question specifically, specifically for Waleed before we bring all of the speakers back. Um, and this question is, uh, how do you think that restricting uh, to papers published in English may bias the results and affect um, conclusions considering the large volume of literature from China, particularly early in the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, a, a very valid point. Um, um, uh, the, the counter argument is um, it is um, unlikely um, that we will miss a large practice changing um, study, um, given the fact that most of those get published in, in, uh, in English. Uh, some may disagree with this, but also we have the safety net of having a couple of experts from, uh, from China who have been involved in almost most of the studies that are done there actually, um, you know, in a leadership position. We're hoping to get some insights from those experts. So the trade-off, you know, here is, okay, let's look at literature from China, translate them, you know, try to summarize the evidence and see if that will help us make any, you know, strong or even weak recommendations versus, um, you know, let's look for, uh, you know, English published literature and uh, ask our colleagues, experts from China to help supplement those if there are any important studies. And, and to um, my memory, I don't recall any, um, uh, you know, non-English study that have been brought to our attention saying, hey, you guys have to look at this or we have to translate this and because it carries, well, not, not to undermine other colleagues' work, I think it's fantastic, but I'm thinking more of, you know, where you draw the threshold and where, you know, which compromise you would make to make your guidelines more efficient. Okay, so um, now, uh, Tamara, Tamara and Allison, is there any way that we can bring videos of all the speakers up or should we do this next session without video of the speakers? Um, so we can see Reem and Walid, Miloslav. Okay. That's great. So, I'm, so I think- I'm sure Paul is somewhere. <laughs> I think he's, he's running an ultra marathon. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I think of maybe a way to start would be um, if any of the speakers have uh, questions or comments for each other. Um, and, and then I would, I would. Reem has her hand up. What? <laughs> Does anybody have? Reem has her hand up. So she's, oh, she's okay. ready with a question or comment. Okay, Reem, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't see the speakers, but. Go ahead, Reem. Well, thanks, uh, Christine and, and Tamara. I, I think, Christine, I, I kind of, um, one point you mentioned is, is worth um, maybe spending some time in discussing, and some of the comments on the chat alludes to it, is this, uh, is this issue around collaboration and application of work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one thing I, I want to mention is before COVID, uh, we actually did a survey in collaboration with the GIN collaboration group and U.S. Great Network, and we surveyed organization. It was a need as, needs assessment for 
in, in around the world organization who actually produce guidelines. And it was very clear, even before COVID, that uh, a lot of the organizations highlighted that they either have no experience with collaboration or very limited experience with collaboration with other organizations. And, and when they had experienced that it was complex, it was very complex and it requires a lot of, um, uh, you know, paperwork and processes and agreements and, and it, that it prolonged the process of guideline development. And, and, and unfortunately, um, I think COVID-19 was a missed opportunity because in, in the clinical world, you know, things like telehealth moved very fast when we thought it will take years, but collaboration within organizations did not move in that same direction. And, and, and there was a time where I personally felt we're in this rapid race, you know, who will get there faster and who will submit to your and other journals faster to get their paper published. And, and, and that's un unfortunate. However, that again speaks to the reality that the time of emergency and urgency is not likely going to be the time when people change their processes and how they're used to do things. So maybe one lesson learned is, is uh, let's take this and realize how important this is. Yes, we would have probably been much more efficient with some of the work if we had established processes that different organizations agreed on. Um, and and, and kind of establish them after COVID or now that we're a little more relaxed with COVID and, and move forward. Um, I, I think this is the one missed, big missed opportunity um, in, in, this, in this pandemic. And I would love to hear others' experiences. So I think in, in our experience, if there is something well done and published, people, uh, some organization that uses to ad adapt or ad adopt a guideline, but it, it wasn't fully an, a collaboration from the beginning to you know, move forward to, together. Well, it seems to me there's two potential ways to collabor collaborate. And maybe one is, I don't think either one is easy, but maybe one is easier during a time of urgency than the other. One would be to establish um, collaborative groups with representation from all the organizations and have that group work on a guideline. The other one would be to um, have a list of topics and rather than have four groups working on a guideline for the, the use of plasma in hospitalized patients to say, okay, you take that, you know, to agree on a, a consistent methodology and have different groups that are used to working together work on the topic um, rather than have that group have to work on 20 topics at a, at a time. So I think there's a way to do it either way, but I think that this, um, I, you know, <laughs> it would make it um, easier on the, it, on everybody, including the journal editors, because literally there are some topics where we have gotten, you know, more than a dozen uh, papers on, this, on the same topic. Um, okay. I, uh... I have a, a, a quick comment, Christine. I, uh, I agree with the sentiment of collaboration. There's, uh, there are a few things that I think should come from the top of the, um, of, of the organization. So professional societies um, that are you know, supporting different guidelines uh, should also carry, carry the same mindset of, of collaboration. You know, and I, th I think it should come from professional society because I think us as scientists, researchers, I, we're always, or most of the time, open for collaboration and, and sharing knowledge and, and uh, learning from each other. Uh, but I think one of the logistics that need to be sorted out is, is also, um, you, you know, professional societies. That's, that's one aspect. The other thing, I don't think, in my opinion, that you know, I think it's wrong to have 50 guidelines on the same topic, absolutely. But I don't think having more than one um, you know, guideline groups issuing recommendations on, on, um, uh, on a certain topic is actually a bad thing because um, there may be some insights from one group uh, that could help the others learn. And also those guidelines may be applicable to a specific context uh, that is not in the other one. For instance, you know, low middle income countries, you know, some of the recommendations that we issued might not be more applicable. So, so you know, having, um, you know, some sort of a, a streamlined process 
is a good thing. Having some sort of a methodology to adopt guidelines as well would, would help minimize duplication of the effort and people going through the same regress steps over and over mm -hmm. and over again. So um, there's a, another. Uh, if I can, if I can maybe, if yeah, I could just maybe just chip in ahead. on that as well. Th thanks, Christine. Yeah, Walid, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think you know we're, we're a nice collaborating on COVID end group and the you know there's the the, the guidelines um, in development registry. I think the more we can share, at least we can have that discussion and see where the debate takes us. Um, uh, just from recent experience of, of working with even within the UK with NHS England you know I think it's a, it's, a, it's a sign of everybody was up and running at the start with with good intention so everybody's trying to get stuff out there because it was super important which is a, a perfectly reasonable um, reaction and it's it's now I think Reem you, you you I think you hit the nail on the head now we're we can maybe pause have a checkpoint and say okay um, let's try and stitch some of this together. But even within, you know, England, even within an English setting, even that's quite hard to do because even the contexts and the, uh, the, the way that, that the different guidelines have been pulled together, it throws up all sorts of wrinkles, you know, in how you can stitch some of these recommendations together. So yes, collaboration, yes, keep the discussion, the dialogue going, and it'd be such a missed opportunity if we, don't take advantage of this and indeed other aspects of guideline development um, that we could learn from and apply to to other settings going forward uh, and as you said we you know clinically um, that's happened hasn't it and and the the, 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 the momentum is always to fall back on what we know and we've got to lock in bake in the good stuff I think so there's an interesting comment from Amir Kasim. So for full disclosure, Amir and I are colleagues at the American College of Physicians. And Amir points out that um, we've been talking about collaboration for a long time and, um, and it happens for, I think he means it doesn't happen or sometimes it happens for complex reasons that have been challenging. And uh, he suggests that maybe one option is to collaborate on splitting the guidelines process from the systematic review process, or because perhaps it's easier to collaborate on a review and then the guideline can be developed by each organization um, for their particular uh, context. Um, he also points out that now we have so many organizations that have popped up to harmonize work on COVID that we need to harmonize the efforts to harmonize. <laughs> um, and, uh, some Roberta James points out that we can't have too much harmony. Um, but I think sometimes we have um, a lot of noise within the, blocking out that harmony. But I think that is interesting. I mean, the systematic review, since there are standard methods, when the key questions are the same, it is rather inefficient to have different groups. Um, Reem? Uh, okay, and yeah. I think one other point that would probably worth some discussion is, is the idea about uh, not only the English language, but I do think um, maybe um, this is the time to again that we can breathe and not work uh, 24 hours a day. Um, that uh, the issue of, about preprints, um, it, it would have been not acceptable for any of us when we started to say, I'm not gonna look at preprints because there was nothing in print at that point. Um, but now it's different. And um, unfortunately, um, again, my perception is uh, in this pandemic, the quality of even published paper is not what we're used to in the pre-COVID era. Some are great, but there's many uh, publications that don't meet standard when you read them. You're like, how did this ever get published? But um, so I think this is also a time to think about um, how are we going to continue to strategize with the huge amount of preprints that exist? And, and, and more importantly, I give you an example from the diagnosis uh, guideline with IDSA. We had to make decisions and we came to the panel proposing, can we only assess 
uh, tests that actually have an EUA or an authorization from the FDA. And the panel said no, because the FDA was changing their authorization and they were pulling tests from the market. And um, so thinking of strategies that are specifically for specific questions with our devices, tests, you know, some, some treatments, and how can we, moving forward, um, become more efficient in these, in these efforts and make the workload um, um, sustainable to continue to update as we should be doing. Good comments. So um, Tamara is reminding me that we have five minutes left. So, um, and I don't think we have any new questions in the chat. So I would like to, um, uh, appreciate, I want like to thank all the speakers for their time and all the attendees for, for your attention. Um, hopefully um, a year or so from now, we'll actually be in person and be able to, um, to to continue this discussion, hopefully with a little bit, a um, little bit calmer, safer times. Um, uh, Tamara, can you forward the slides? Okay, so I just want to remind everybody that um, there, the uh, GIN COVID-19 resource page is updated regularly, uh, has many useful links and useful information, um, and you can find it at the URL that's listed on the screen. Uh, next slide. And I um, want to remind people of a new partnership with McMaster University um, and, uh, and Jin on guideline development, credentialing, and certification called indi.org. And there is a session on this, I believe, on Friday. I think session four will cover that. And so uh, thank you for attending the webinar. I'll remind people that there's um, another session tomorrow and one on Friday, at least, at least in the part of the world that I'm in. There's one tomorrow and one on Friday. They may differ a little bit. Um, and, uh, and just appreciate, um, again, all the speakers. I learned a lot and um, also extend a thanks to our lead moderator, uh, Tamara. Thank you. Goodbye, goodbye, everyone. Send your papers to Annals. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for goodbye. the wonderful speakers. Thanks, everyone. And Holger's just posted session three on recommendation mapping and session four on living recommendations. Excellent. Yeah.